Welcome back to the Wrong Advice Podcast. I'm your host, John Pachuto, and I am extremely excited to have my very, very good friend, the one and only Aaron Willett, episode number 75 guest. Aaron, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast and even more excited to have you be the 75th guest on the show. Um, can you give a quick introduction to who you are? Sure. Um going to be 33 in two weeks. Happy you birthday. It's on my calendar. Yeah, I'm 33. I work in the medical field as a vascular technologist, and I live in Southern California. Wow. Just and I, yeah. So you and I have been internet acquaintances for, you know, I wish there was a way to like look up on Twitter, like how long you've known a person and or like followed a person. Um, I know. But the very first time uh, I checked, like, the first DM I sent was, like, 2010 or something like that. So we've known each other a pretty fairly long period of time. Um, oh, yeah. Which is wild. Wild and crazy kids. Um, but so I know kind of your backstory of, like, how you ended up in California as a Jersey girl uh, who was born and raised here. But give me a little bit of, like, uh, the context to how you ended up doing the thing you're doing and in the position that you are in currently living in a much sunnier and warmer California. Um, I honestly don't really have a good answer. It depends on who asks me what answer <laughs> I give, because there's obviously a bunch of different reasons. So, like, I guess as far as my career choice, being a vascular technologist, I just got super lucky. I had no idea that it even existed. So I just kind of happened to fall into it, and I love it, and I'm good at it. So, um, What exactly is a vas- vascular technician? So the simplest way to say it is I do ultrasounds of the veins and arteries from your brain to your toes, except for your heart. Oh. You don't want to see me. (laughs) Yeah. You don't want to have to see me. I'm unfortunately, due to, you know, family medical stuff, acutely aware of what you do and extremely (laughs) familiar with what you do. Um, But that's so wild. So how does, you know, how do you get into something like that? Like what, what like sort of drove you into that field? Like it is highly technical highly you know like specified and wild (laughs) well my mom is a nurse so I kind of grew up with her being a nurse and I was unfortunately sick a lot as a kid my older sister was really sick a lot so we were always in and out of hospitals and having tests done and stuff like that so I thought I wanted to be a nurse and in high school when I told my my mom that she said really, Aaron, you want to be a nurse? Like, you can't even pick up after your dog without gagging. Like, there's no way that you're cut out for that. And I said, oh, a nurse has to, like, clean up a person like that? And she said, yeah, what do you think they do? I said, I thought they, you know, take your temperature and your blood pressure. Like, I didn't have any clue back then. So I said, okay, maybe not that. Maybe I'll be, like, a, an x-ray tech or something. And when I actually got into looking at the different it's called like allied health like diagnostic Mm -hmm. technology for medicine i thought i wanted to do nuclear medicine but i was told by my professors that i wasn't smart enough my grades were not good enough yeah wow that's fucked um this was in college or was this like post yeah and it was only one of my classes that i had like a c in or something and she was like no i think we should look at something else So I went to the open house. I tried out for nuclear medicine and for vascular technology, and I got into both programs. Oh, sweet. So I got to pick, and it just so turned out, like, once I did more research that I didn't want to be involved in all the radiation and stuff like that. Ultrasound's very, very safe. Mm -hmm. Um, So I went with that, and I got just, I just got lucky. (laughs) I really liked it, so I got lucky. Where did you go to college? Um. Well, I had to go to two schools. Um, One is called Georgian Court University. (laughs) It's an (laughs) all-girls Nice. (laughs) And I did three years there, and then you have to do two years of the dedicated vascular program, which was UMDNJ, which doesn't exist anymore. What? Rutgers Rutgers bought it, yeah. Wow. Did not know that. One of my best friends graduated from there. That's so weird. Yeah. RIP, UMDNJ. I mean, it still exists just under... Yeah, it's Rutgers. Rutgers Medical School now, right? It's crazy. So I've often harped upon on my podcast like how it's taken me 
let's call it 34 years to figure out like the thing that I wanted to do and the thing that makes me happy from like a work perspective, which is obviously photography and, and this podcast to a lesser extent. Now I've known you for a while and you are like supremely happy in the thing that you do from a work perspective. Cause like you just love your job and you're obviously very good at it. Um, but like at what point in your college life and like your, early working life did it feel like you kind of like found your your place and like we're doing the thing that you were designed to do made to do good at doing um luckily that's kind of why i went into doing what i did like i did the research knowing once i finish here i graduate i pass my registry exams i go and get a job it took me a while to find a job that i was happy in the place that you do your work in is means a lot the type of patients you know the setting all those things so that took me a little bit of time but yeah no you just go into it and you start doing the job so I really the only work I had to do was getting paid more <laughs> <laughs> don't we all don't we all <laughs> that comes with experience so I have 10 years under my belt now and I'm good yeah. so yeah um, obviously in a field where like there's a, a vast array of qualifications, right? Like you work with doctors on varying degrees on, uh, you know, daily basis and, you know, people from nurses to, you know, head of sur surgery and shit like that. Um, do you find it to be a difficult place to work? Like to feel sort of respected for the stuff that you do? Like, do you, do you ever feel out of sorts or out of place in, in the environment that you work in? Um, Yes and no. Um, fortunately, most doctors are really respectful of their technologists hmm. because without me, they're, they don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm their eyes and ears inside of the patient. So I'm the one that's looking and I'm the one that's finding the things and interpreting it. You know, a lot of the doctors, unfortunately, don't really do that or they don't feel confident doing it because they don't do it as much as we do. Our hands are actually on the patient and looking in real time. But the patients, however, don't realize that. Yeah, right. <laughs> they think I'm just, you know, waving my magic wand. <laughs> you know, they're shocked when I tell them that my bachelor's degree is in vascular technology. That's my degree. So, um, yeah, they have no idea how instrumental I am <laughs> in literally <laughs> diagnosing them or helping them keep their limbs or whatever, whatever it is. But uh, that's kind of a, a good thing, too. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I mean, you're you're doing work that can directly impact the life of a human being, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. And like, I do nothing like that, right? Like there's nothing that I do in my life on a day-to-day -day basis that will like positively impact someone's <laughs> longevity of, <Not> true. <laughs> well, listen, if I take your picture, it does last forever, but if you die, <laughs> like it will not mean because I did anything. So yeah, totally. Um, one of the things that I like to talk about is like how for some reason or another, I'm just like a supremely confident human being and like comfortable in my own skin. Um, you as a person who used to be like, you know, you were on the chive and like all these like websites in the 2000s and stuff, like you're a pretty girl. Like what was that experience like in sort of like shaping your confidence in your work life, right? Like does like the, that pseudo level of internet fame ever cross over into giving you confidence into like the um, like the day-to-day -day work that you do in life? Like, does that stuff help at all? Um, honestly, I don't think so. As interesting as an experience it was with all the internet stuff and Twitter and, you know, whatever it was, it wasn't really anything. It was, you know, my 15 minutes, I guess. <laughs> yeah. This is all that. Um, and I actually lost quite a lot of friends that didn't agree with me doing that. They Not were, right? wow. Yeah, they were really upset that they were included in some of my pictures and they thought it was going to uh, reflect poorly on them wow. if it was foreseen and stuff. So if anything, it kind of made me really paranoid. It was, the, and it was the chive. It wasn't Playboy. What the hell? <laughs> they were. Well, I went to an all girls Catholic university. Uh, very, you know, um, I don't know what the word is. I guess I would go with sheltered, oh, maybe, yeah. you know, they just. That, that scared them back in the day. You know, it wasn't, we didn't have OnlyFans and yeah. all these other things that we have now. So yeah. The normalization really of, 
of sex work. Yeah. I mean, the chive was never sex work, but like the, where are leaps and bounds from the internet those days. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, they didn't really agree with it. And yeah, it made me really, really paranoid as far as, you know, getting a job. What if someone Googles me back then? Oh you know, yeah. Oh, be? I never thought about that. My, um, my Google so, history is so problematic. Like there's just so much <laughs> dumb shit. I mean, like, thankfully I've never been arrested or anything catastrophic, but you know, I used to write on the internet a lot for places like elite daily and all these other websites and stuff. And I wrote just not like bad shit but just dumb shit like if someone read something that i wrote you know 10 plus years ago they'd be like dude you're an (laughs) idiot why would you put this on paper and like put it out for people i could imagine how that would play into like being concerned about like jobs and stuff like that for sure thankfully for you it's just like you modeled big deal yeah i didn't do anything that i'm ashamed of at all but you never know how somebody else might look at it or what assumptions or conclusions they might draw from it yeah i think the the most shocking thing to me as a photographer and i've worked with like stupidly handsome men to like breathtakingly beautiful women is that like a lot of them don't necessarily just because they are like aesthetically pleasing feel comfortable in their own skin And I can't relate to that, right? So, like, I can't – when they're, like, not feeling the shoot and they're, like, not – you know, when they're in their head trying to, like, get into the the moment and, like, take the picture and be the person that they're supposed to be on the other end of the camera, if they're having a hard time, I can't relate because I'd be like, oh, just do it like this. And, like, I'm doing it, right? But I feel fine in my own skin. And I'm just just super – interested in learning how those sort of lack of confidence like plays into people's lives outside of you know doing the fun thing right hmm. um yeah no i definitely when my my very first photo shoot with the chive they literally had to like take my hand and put it you know places because uh, i was just taking like a leap i was like oh nervous, like yeah. what do i do and you know, I, I never looked at myself and thought, damn, I should be in pictures. <laughs> so definitely fell out of my element. But I think luckily, that's why I am so confident at work is because I know that I'm good. I know that I'm smart. I know the grades that I got. I know the recommendations that I've gotten. I know the people that I've worked with. I know that's all really, really good. And I'm actually really proud of that because I don't doubt myself too much professionally Uh, these days so fucking jealous of that i have (laughs) self-doubt imposter syndrome times a billion and i don't know if that is something that is like mutually exclusive to a creative career right like you know i'm sure if you're a surgeon there are times where you could be worried about cutting someone open and oh i can't do this or whatever like you know i does a priest get nervous before he goes up and talks (laughs) to his congregation i would imagine not it's something you do a million times but like for me that the first five minutes before I do my quote unquote job, I'm what are you doing here? You don't belong here. You're a fraud. You're a fake. Like what are you doing? It's crazy, and it's it's so un unlike myself in any other realm of my life. Um, when you look at the fact that you have found the thing that you belong in, um, is there a way that you look at like how you measure success in your career? Right? Is it just like proper diagnoses? like effective techniques like how do you look at the thing that you do in life and and create a success metric for it Hmm, um i don't know i for me it's just my happiness and my comfort um as long as you know i'm making enough money to keep a roof over my head and food in my belly then i'm happy i mean i could go off and write journal articles every month and do all these conferences and get more certifications and more letters next to my name. But I don't know, maybe I'm not ambitious enough. I'm just really totally content like yeah. content to be doing what I'm doing. I set out to do it 10 years ago. Like I worked my butt off. I paid a lot of money to yeah. learn how to do it. Like, yeah. this is it. I mean, every once in a while I'm like, man, I wish I was a doctor or man, it would be cool to do surgery or something. But then I look at the doctors that I work with and I'm like, I would not do good under those circumstances. You wouldn't have a life, you know, you're working mm. all the time. Yeah. It, it's really hard. So yeah, no, I'm measuring my success. Um, yeah, just do a good job and make the doctors happy and make the patients happy. So yeah, kind of short, luckily I am, uh, 
I don't want to say I'm jealous of like that comfortability and stability in, in your work life, but like it took me, you know, the entirety of my working career and then getting laid off in the pandemic to like figure out like who the person I am and like what I want to do. And, you know, I'm, I'm totally envious of people. Envy is definitely the right word who like are able to uncover the thing that they were meant to do at a younger age than me. And a question I ask myself a lot is like, you know, could 25 year old John have learned the life lessons that 35 year old John had to be taught in the worst imaginable situation. And I often go back to no, right? Like I I don't think that the things that I learned in the last two years could have been implemented at an earlier time. Like I think it takes that sort of time and longevity in life. Yeah. I mean, unless you needed, couple of letters next to your name to be <laughs> photographer, then maybe you would know like, hey, I have to go to school for this. I have to pass all these tests. I have to try really hard. And you would have like a roadmap laid out in front of you. But you don't. So yeah, I, I get I will always have those letters. Well, God willing, we'll always have those letters. And so that automatically qualifies me to do is that, that a thing you have to like renew every year? No, you have to you have to pass two exams initially after you finish the program with proof that you finished and all that stuff and then you really just have to do like any medical um career you have to do the continuing medical education so you have to get a certain amount of credits Uh by going to relevant talks and whatever else gotcha that's really it that's interesting um we're both in our mid-30s i guess me gearing up towards whoa whoa well, it's 35. I'm, 30, I'm still 32. Okay. Well, in, in, in a week, two weeks, you're going to be 33, which is closer to mid than the beginning. Um, no. <laughs> I have often uh, said that I feel like my life is in a completely different place than pretty much all of my friends and family, right? Like every single person I know is married, they have kids or kids on the way or what have you. Um, do you ever look at like where your place is amongst like your group of friends and or family and compare yourself and like, Oh, I feel X, Y, Z about ABC. And comparing myself to my friends career wise. No, like life wise, like relationship wise, -wise, like, you know, there's all that inherent societal pressure to be married by a certain age and have kids by a certain age and own a home by a certain age. Like, do you feel any of that? Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, I dated my very first boyfriend uh, from high school for a super long time. I thought for sure we were going to be married, like 100% thought that we would be settled by now with the house and all that stuff. But luckily, it didn't go (laughs) down like that. But yeah, now I'm still painfully single at, like you said, 33. And I did not think that this was going to be how it was. Um, Not that I necessarily think it's a bad thing, but... Yeah, I don't at all. um, Not just for you. I mean, for me personally. Like, you know, I don't think it is a bad thing. Like, I think, like, statistically, we've both avoided our first divorce, which is a huge blessing, (laughs) both financially (laughs) and emotionally. And, you know, we get an opportunity now. So, like, I, I... In my 20s, there was always so much pressure around dating, right? There was always, like, inherent pressure on where I took them to eat, what I, where we went, how fancy the place was, like all these things that didn't really matter and like how the relationship progressed and like when we kissed and when we had sex and all these things that like didn't really matter. And I feel zero pressure dating in my thirties because I think I know who I am, right? I don't have to pretend to be someone that I'm not anymore. And in that way, it's been like a super freeing sort of time, albeit a two year delay during the pandemic. But other than that, yeah, like I feel so much more confident in in what I'm doing. Yeah, as painfully single (laughs) as I am, um, I'm quite confident that the next person, if I'm, you know, if I manage to find some idiot that will (laughs) date me, um, you know, I'm quite confident that I now know that the only thing that someone in my life would have to do is make my life better in some way like if they're not bringing like addition to my life then I don't need it like oh, whoever is going to be pretty spectacular because I've already got this on my own mm-hmm. so unless they're going to enhance some part of my life um and obviously get along well and all those you know normal things yeah. uh then yeah it's not gonna that's happen that's so, so crucial too like I I, I say often 
like I'm not looking for arm candy. I'm not looking for necessarily the mother of my children because I don't even know if I want kids, but I want to share my life with someone. I want someone that can come into my life and fit the places in which I am not I'm lacking, right? And that is in companionship and cuddling and, <laughs> and like all those things. <laughs> but like I am supremely comfortable in my life as John alone. And I think you are too, which is why I think our friendship has kind of grown so much in the last couple of years. Um, which I'm happy. Yeah, definitely know now that I will not put up with any sort of drama. There's literally no reason. So I, I, uh, I often talk about how there's like, you know, when you're in high school, you got to get good grades to go to a good college. And when you're in college, you got to get good grades so you can get a good first job. And then it's like, oh, where am I going to be at 25 and 30 and 35? And everything is like this five year arc of where I'm going to be and what I'm going to be doing. Um, did you have a lens like that, you know, throughout your life to this point? And if so, do you still? A lens like where I'm going to be in five years, what I'm going to be doing, who I'm going to be doing with, with, et cetera. No, I feel like I'm weird. Like I don't think about that stuff. I feel like everybody else does. And I just don't in a way. I I don't know. Maybe it's because I didn't get married like when I was 18 like I thought I was going to that I've just like thrown that all out. I'm just like whatever will happen is going to happen, but um yeah, no. I I don't care where I am in 5 years. I hope I'm here and doing good. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, I like I appreciate that. Like my 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 barometer for what is going on in my life is no longer where I'll be five years from now. It's like, where am I going to be five days from now? Right? Like, am I going to be happy when I wake up in the morning? The things that are truly important are like the health and happiness of myself, my friends, my family, and like making sure that all that stuff is, you know, in line with life, right? Like the important things that you learn in a pandemic when you can't leave your house for two years. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. I'm just trying to be a better person. And however I, see fit like whatever I think is gonna make myself better then that's what I do and lately I'm realizing that mm, how do I say this Um, I've noticed that your happiness comes from things um, that you can't really go and seek out all the time honestly you know I don't think any amount of money is gonna make me any happier than I am I don't think a different job I don't think a boyfriend I don't think a hundred million little dogs running around (laughs) nah that might that might (laughs) you know I don't put a smile on your face but I think that um as I get older when I can walk away from work or a situation and feel good about it and have good uh positive interactions with people maybe help somebody you know make somebody smile or laugh I feel like that is way more fulfilling as I get older so yeah I'm trying to focus more on that kind of stuff even though it's not always easy yeah no for sure you know so the greatest lesson I think that I've learned over the last two years is that true life happiness comes from within right so if you're not happy with yourself and the person that you are and the things that you're doing nothing added to that will make you a happy person right a million dollars a year in a salary not going to make you happier the love of a wonderful man or woman is not going to make you happier if inherently in your own skin you're not a happy person and that being said like happiness is a distorted lens right like that is a momentary thing like you could be the happiest person in the world at 10 a.m on a monday and then by 2 p.m who the fuck knows where you could be but (laughs) it's a matter of like perspective of like you know i i i I say the biggest cliche all the time it's like i'm just happy to be here right like i'm happy that i'm alive and healthy and my family is alive and healthy and i've got a great group of friends and a career that i love and a lot of that gets taken for granted sometimes yeah i think oh i i you know, that's put into perspective for me on a daily basis. I'm typically like, like I said, you don't want to see me at work. You don't want to meet vascular technologists. I'm taking care of pretty much people, people over 50. A lot of them are 70 to 90 years old. And I see how hard life is going to be. It doesn't matter how healthy you are or how well you take care of yourself or how much money, like your body is going to break down. Your body does not improve as you age. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, constantly working out or you're a vegan. It, it Sometimes it literally doesn't 
matter. And I also see the patients that struggle because they're doing it on their own. They don't have their children around to take care of them or, you know, whoever it is, you're going to need someone when you get older. Like it's not, not going to be easy. It's every single patient tells me like getting old sucks. Yeah. They all. So I'm acutely aware that I have about <laughs> 30 good more years in me, maybe. And, I mean, uh, that's based on the assumption that the human race has 30 more good years in us. <laughs> right. I, yeah. Never know at this point. Right. I constantly yeah. say it's like we live in the most exhaustive time to be alive. Right. There is just all this inherent craziness of the world. I mean, forget about Russia and Ukraine and all that shit and COVID and all that stuff. It's just a tiring time to be alive. You're like faking it till you make it on the internet. You're like worried about what the people on social media are doing. And it's like all that stuff just is a cause for, you know, depression and angst that doesn't need to actually exist because people put on rose colored glasses and pretend to be someone that they're not. No, it's true. I think our generation has it like really, really bad. You know, the, oh, the millennials yeah. of us that grew up you know, with uh, no cell phones and <laughs> we didn't have GPS. We had to like print out MapQuest directions and stuff <laughs> like that. So there's something. And then the, the people younger than us, the younger generation, they went and like made a 30 second video on TikTok and now they all have more money than I ever will. It's like, what is life? Well, it's not all too late to start dancing, me. Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too late. They told me from you know a young age they tell you you have to go to school you have to get good grades like you were saying before in order to succeed and now that's kind of got flipped upside down like i i am very jealous of that i've always felt that the so like i had the best college experience possible i went to a really big school i made a ton of really close friends that i'm still close with today and i had a fucking blast like it was just the best four-year period of my life I didn't fucking learn anything. Like, I didn't go there and walk away with a degree in neuroscience, and now I'm, like, curing brain cancer, right? I got a fucking economics degree because it was the easiest one that I could get into from the business school because my grades sucked because I never went to class because I was partying all the time. That $100,000 that I spent over that four years could be doing so much more for my life. I, had I taken two years from 18 to 20 and just traveled the world my life would be completely different. And that's one of the nice things about the time that we live in because the fallacy that we need to get good grades and go to good school to get a good job and do something with our lives is not true anymore, right? Like right. There, there are other avenues to be like a successful functioning human being, whether that entails dancing on the internet or I don't know. <laughs> oh, so funny. I, uh, I, my biggest fear in life is you know, sad to say is dying and you spend an acute amount of time per day, like in and around death and pending death and, you know, disease and stuff. Um, how does that like make you feel on a daily basis? Like, how do you like unpack that? How do you like come home a after having a tough day and, you know, seeing potential future tragedies unfold with your patients? Like, how do you like unwind and, and, and pull away from that? Hmm. Well, luckily, I don't, I don't normally get those kind of updates in real time. It's uh -huh. not really the, like after the fact that you click on someone's chart and it comes up deceased or something. And, yeah. you know, that's always like, oh, man, I liked her. Oh, like he was so sweet or something like that. Um, or the next time they come for an ultrasound and their foot is now missing because uh -huh. they needed it amputated. Like that's a, a, definitely a bummer. And I'm definitely scared scared of dying as well <laughs> that's a huge fear but um yeah I don't know I think it makes me think of my grandparents more than anything else because they're still around and they're the age of these patients so it just always makes me worry about them and you know that's always on my mind unfortunately but yeah I guess I guess it doesn't really affect you gotta it's part of the job I yeah, guess yeah you gotta like com compartmentalize it yeah, I mean, COVID was the hardest thing because people were dying all the time. You see them, like, getting CPR in front of your eyes. Jesus. There's people our age that are dying. Like, that was really, really hard. That definitely, that was not easy. But, um, yeah, on a day-to-day -day -day basis, I'm lucky enough that even though it's kind of doom and gloom, it's not. <laughs> it's not the immediacy of it. Yeah, it's not like hospice or cancer or anything like that. You know? Yeah, that's good. 
Um, I think, you know, from, uh, you know, I'm biased, obviously, I've known you for a while, and we've become really good friends. Like, it's it's awesome that it seems to me that like, on a daily basis, like you're living your dream, like you've got the job that you want, you've got a future new awesome apartment, you've got an adorable little puppy, you've got amazing plants and such like life is good. Um, if you were to do anything else in your life, like what would be like your biggest dream? Like, what would you be doing? Besides what you're currently doing? Like as a career? As anything. What would be like the biggest dream that you had? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I'm so simple. Like I told you before, <laughs> like I feel weird that I don't think about the future. I'm not like ambitious and stuff. I don't know. I'm really like simple. I would have a flower shop or something like that. That's awesome. Or, I don't know. Something with animals. I don't know. Something that makes me happy. I would love to say that I would do art. But every time I try to do art for money, that's really stressful for me. So yeah. <laughs> probably not that. And uh, I tend to fall out of my, you know, artistic streaks fairly easily too. So yeah, no, I don't. You're I wish I it. had a. You're doing. I it. wish I had a good answer. Yeah, it's simple, but I am doing it. So that's that's uh, rare, Aaron. <laughs> that is very rare. Well, I, I know. I feel really lucky. Like I said in the very beginning very fortunate i don't know how i'm like on a small scale very unlucky person but on a <laughs> well, on the relationship scale, scale very unlucky on a <laughs> overall life happiness level you're, you're you've got it going on yeah i mean how many people from new jersey can say they moved across the country started a job on their own and they pay all you know like there's a lot of people that don't get to do this mm -hmm. uh, you know struggle for whatever reasons with whatever things that they struggle with and not that i don't struggle yeah <laughs> not that i have like a per picture perfect life no but, of course nobody does yeah, on a day-to-day -day basis like i said i would consider myself lucky i would say that number is probably like six hundred thousand people have gone from new jersey to i'm just kidding <laughs> like you're like how many people I'm like at six hundred and four thousand five hundred and twenty one well, I mean, I know for me, when I lived in New Jersey, it's just like, that's not, uh, that's not a possibility. Like people, I found that when I was growing up, I know at least my own family, they think I'm, they thought I was crazy. You're what? <laughs> How are you going to get your stuff there? Where are you going to live? Like all of these questions. I'm like, you literally just do it. You know, you just pick up your stuff and you take it with you. And uh, it, it took someone saying to me, well, why don't you just move? For me to be like, oh, yeah, I could move, but where would I move? And then it was like, yeah, why would I just pick up and move somewhere else? But then when I thought about it, I was like, no, I really can just pick up and go somewhere else. 100%. I think that's, uh, there's a TikTok or like a viral video that goes around. It's like, if you have just left the place where you were born and gone somewhere and started a life for yourself, you're you're killing it like I, it's not that's not what it is verbatim right but it's like anybody who's been able to take a situation where they grew up from they're comfortable they're safe and life is adequate and uprooted that to chase a dream to do something else to like have a totally entirely different life like that's something to be proud of like that's it's inspiring I mean that inspires me like I've always toyed with the idea of moving and moving to Chicago or Miami or LA and then, like, I just, I don't think I would function in those places. Like, I, I like, my heart is in New York City. Like, my family is here. My nieces, my nephews. Like I, like, I could never just, I mean, unless I bought a van and moved down by the river or something. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, you, I thought that way, too, when I first moved out here. And I was naive enough to tell myself, oh, you can go back anytime. Yeah. Oh, it's just plain right away. And then when you get to be an adult, and it's like, wow, that's a really crappy flight it's and the worst. not deep and who wants to go back to the freezing cold <laughs> uh, i do <laughs> i love so. it here i mean yeah my thing is like, i i would i turned down a job uh in 2010 to work with a uh california-based hockey team and it turned out to be like one of those blessings in disguise. Like my grandmother ended up passing away very shortly after I turned down the job. And like, it was just a weird time in my life. And it was like one of those things where I was like, I was glad I did it. I didn't take the job and I was here for that stuff. But I think those are things like that you have to explore with your life, right? Like you don't have to get locked into the people, places and things if they don't make sense anymore. Like you people grow and you outgrow circumstance, situations and location. Um, 
so it's funny. I uh, I've I've for the most part lived my life without regret and like sort of just been incredibly proud of like the things that I've done, right? Like whether it was high school sports, whether it was going away to college and graduating in 4 years, like like I'm proud of myself. Like I've writ artic- written articles on the internet that millions of people have seen and liked and like you know, I'm I created a career for myself out of the ashes of losing my job in the pandemic. And like I'm just like proud of the human being that I've become over the last, you know, 36 and some odd months of life. Um, what are you most proud about for for yourself? Yeah, I think we just talked about it. I mean, just having the guts to do what I did, you know, moving out here. And I'm definitely proud of, you know, my education and, you know, my good reputation in my field. I think that's something to be proud of. Yeah, doing it on your own, it's, it's hard. And mm-hmm. um I definitely isolated myself in a big way so that I got to do everything extra by myself. So yeah, proud of, proud of that stuff for sure. That's awesome. Um, so talk to me about what internet fame felt like at an early age, right? Like you were a young person who had like Aaron motherfucking Willett was like famous on the interwebs. Is that like a crazy feeling? Is that like a, I mean, as a woman, I would imagine you had all sorts of wildly crazy interactions with human beings. Like, what was that like? And like, how did that impact your life? Well, like I said, it was not really like big stardom or anything. It was more the 15 minutes of fame, but it was cool at first. It re- it really was eye opening. I had no idea, you know, any of that really I don't know. I don't know how to even put it just mm-hmm. to describe it um, plainly. But um, no, it was very weird to see people reaching out to me and um, comments that people would make. I was just like, I'm just a normal person. What the heck are you <laughs> writing me a five page email for? Like, I, <laughs> I love don't you. know you, um, but they're pouring out their heart to me and this, Aww. that and the other. It's just kind of like mind blowing. I was like, "Whoa, there is a big you saw world out." A picture of me, and now I've got a fifty-one paragraph email to read. Yeah, it's it's absolutely wild. Or the stuff that people will will infer from you, or you know, or, or assume of you, I should say. And uh, I don't know, very, very, very strange. <laughs> wild time to be alive, for sure. Yeah, I mean, but it, it's also been very cool. I think a, a lot of my really good friends that I still have to this day, I would not have met if I didn't do any of that stuff on the internet. Oh, I mean, interesting. I mean, if I think about it, when I first moved out here, I didn't know anybody out here. So literally, people, not a single person. Not one. I mean, the people from the chive that you know those people I knew, but I wasn't going to be hanging out with them on a daily basis. You know, they weren't going to be my new friends or anything. Um, Support system, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I ended up meeting people through that, actually through Twitter. Like, some of my best friends that we hang out on a weekly basis, they're, you know, from back in the day. Or talk digitally every day, like people who still live in New Jersey. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That long distance pen pal thing. (laughs) From pen pals to podcast guest, we can do it all. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's funny because like uh, there's a, a really sort of uh, unique time happening in the digital space with like digital art and NFTs and crypto and like all this weird shit that's going on. But it's also been a cool place for me because I've started to feel like I'm found like a little bit of a community for myself on line like in twitter and and instagram friends and like people who like admire my work and my work ethic and and the photography that i do and the podcast that i so i feel like i've I've gotten to this point where like i found this community of like you know internet friends and people on the internet who i have common interests with and like who want to see me be successful that's not to say like my friends and family who i see all the time are not wanting to see me be successful it's like the exact opposite they like support me unconditionally but we don't have like that art life stuff in in common and for me it's like turning into a point where like a lot of people that i've met on the internet are becoming really close and good friends and it's kind of nice it's you know finding communities whether it's you know people in your life that you've known since kindergarten which i have or you know new friends on the internet it's it's nice it's it's weird for sure not something that i would have expected but it's not not a bad thing 
No, community is huge. No matter like what you do uh, in career wise, your, your colleagues, that that's hugely important. Your friends, your family, you know, all of those things are supremely important no matter what you need a community around you. I would so. say the hardest thing about being, so like I'm a solo self-employed human being, right? Like, so I don't have coworkers and like the coworkers I do have, they're new every time I meet them. Right. So whether it's a model, whether it's a band, whatever it is, I don't have that like steady community around me. It's, it's ebbing and flowing with time. Um, and I, I have found, it's funny. Like I make jokes all the time. Like there's a website, I think it's called adult but it's like for sex. I was like, I would like to make a, an adult friend finder where it's like, I need to make more friends in my thirties who don't have kids that can go get beers on Wednesdays. You know what I mean? Like, it's funny, but it's true. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, it's, you know, hard to find a community to belong to, but I don't think it necessarily always has to be with, you know, your hobby or your career. Oh, yeah. But I- can imagine that for you especially having a community to talk about something especially creative to bounce ideas off of or you know just hear somebody else's perspective i mean you could apply this to the medical field too like one person thinks it's this diagnosis and the other person thinks that that happens all of the time and without people to discuss it with you you just in an echo chamber talking to yourself which is never good echo chamber a term that can be used to describe a myriad of pro- myriad of problems that we have as a society <laughs> to say the least yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> um i like to spend the last bit of every podcast doing sort of like a q a um some Is of the it over? <laughs> not yet no i mean this part takes a while <laughs> Oh, okay. um so there are some super easy ones and there are some a little bit more in-depth ones um but my very first question for you is what is your favorite book uh, my favorite book is probably, um, I'm going to go with Cat's Cradle. Oh, I'm shocked. I was really leaning towards Lord of the Rings. No, dude, I got Kurt Vonnegut tattooed on my oh, body. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> Not Vonnegut. Anything Vonnegut, probably, but Cat's Cradle is just like, whew, yeah. love it. I would, I... I think there's a very strong possibility that you inspired me to read my first Vonnegut novel. Like, I feel like six or seven years ago, I put definitely put on Twitter, like, what should I read? And I'm 95% sure you, you? definitely, I'm like a hundred, almost a hundred percent positive. Wait, I, what did you read? Oh, I've read like eight of his books. Um, oh, yeah. What was the first one? Uh, oh my God. What was the first one? Um, five. What was it? Slaughterhouse Five. Slaughterhouse Five. I read that wasn't the first one. Oh, actually, I probably read that in high school, so I don't know if that counts because mm-hmm. I probably didn't read it. I probably read the Cliff Notes. Um, <laughs> oh, fuck it. Maybe it's called like uh, Kurt Vonnegut on Life or something. Uh, oh man, I'm literally gonna do this live and look it up because now it's driving me crazy. His books have like strange titles. Oh, they're all weird. Um, yeah. And I gotta look this up live, like on the podcast, because I need to know how many of these books I know I don't remember how do you did you just remember this we never talked about this no no not oh man without a country was the very first one I read in 2015 oh, okay. mm. like I said I probably read slaughterhouse five in high school I think that was like one of my summer reading books yeah yeah cool what's your favorite movie this one I know <laughs> how do you know I can't even know it's it, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings so, yeah. and all of them not gonna pick one out of all of those amazing amazing movies yeah that's fair um i we have done uh digital binge watches <laughs> coast to yeah. coast and and gone through a, a vast majority of those i am wildly excited about the worlds that are being created around these films that were like played such a huge part of our childhoods like whether it be the mandalorian uh any of the shows that disney plus is putting out right now and then there's I don't know when, but like the end, the end of this year or something, the Lord of the Rings stuff that's coming to Amazon Studios, Amazon Prime, etc. It's a cool time to be a nerd. Let me tell you. Um. Yeah. I mean, and it's not even nerdy anymore. Like Star Wars is not nerdy. Like everybody likes Star Wars. I know, now. but now, it... you're, now it's almost cool to not like Star Wars. <laughs> else likes it you know it's that that is annoying to me because like as a kid like it was lame to like star wars it was lame to like lord of the rings and now it's gone the other way and everyone watches all this shit and they're all hyped on it it's like man come on 
I was watching yeah, this shit like in the nineties. Like fuck you. <laughs> I can't go a birthday or a Christmas now without getting something Star Wars. Like the amount of Star Wars <laughs> socks and T shirts and junk that I have. Like that that didn't exist back then, like at all, hardly. Well, that's what happens when Disney buys something. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Money, money. Merch merch overload. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what's your favorite food? Um, like like I probably Italian food, anything Italian. You have like a particular favorite? No, I change it. It's it's a cheeseburger. I'm oh, not uh, yeah, burgers. I gotta be honest. So for the listeners out there, Aaron skipped burgers out with coworkers to fucking do this podcast with me, and I feel so happy and special that I get yeah. an, I get an hour of Willett's time. When she is definitely starving for a fucking cheeseburger right now. <laughs> oh my gosh, I could be eating dry aged beef Ooh. between buns right now. <laughs> that sounds really good. I had uh, a very lackluster salad for dinner, so I think I'm going to have to get a burger tomorrow now. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to. Um, do you believe in an afterlife? Yeah, heck yeah, I'm going straight up. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Oh, my God. That's so funny. Um, I think one of the most reassuring things that uh, I've had in my life is that... So this is episode 75. I want to say I've asked that question 60 plus times to like individual people. And 80% or more think there is something after we die. And that's awesome. Like, that is a reassuring feeling. Like, you know, my biggest fear is dying. Not really something I'm looking forward to. But I do believe there is something after. I think if you were to live a life and, and expect nothing to transpire after, it's like, what's the point? What do you, what do you, what do you, what's the point? Yeah, that is, that's something I recently came to learn because I used to be one of those people that thought we just got put in the dirt and you just sit there. And I did not realize how hard that made my life entirely. Oh. Interesting. It really, you know, because like you said, you have nothing to live for. What yeah. is the point? You're constantly, you know, going through life, which is always going to have downs or lows or valleys, however you want to put it. How are you going to have those throughout your life and feel like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. You're just not going to even want to be here then, because why am I suffering and going through all of this stuff just for like momentary happiness here and there when I get the opportunity to do something cool or, you know, whatever it is. Totally. So knowing that I'm going to go and see my family and live, um, yeah, like, yeah, I can't. The version I, of Earth is sounds amazing to me. I, so. I completely agree. And like, I don't have. Like I don't, I don't argue with people based on their context for like religion or whatever they think does happen when they die. Like I'm a holy spiritual person who prays a lot and like is has a supreme belief that things happen for a reason and something will happen when we die, whether it's a party in the sky or you know whatever. I have no fucking idea, but like it would be a tremendously tragic way to live a life thinking that we live, we die, and that's it. The lights go off and there's nothing else. That, that, yeah, that'd or be sad. <laughs> Like me, I used to, people would be like, not like people would ask me this all the time, but you know, when the subject comes up, I used to think it was funny to be like, oh, well, I'm going to hell anyway. Like, <laughs> see you there. Oh. And I thought that was like, cool. Like, dust your show, like, see you in hell. Like, ha, yeah. ha, ha, I'm such a cold hard bitch. But meanwhile, the worst thing you've ever done is probably, <laughs> that's like the worst thing you've ever done is get like a speeding ticket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll never tell. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, are you happy? No, you know this. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking miserable. <laughs> oh, come on. It's not true. No, honestly, like I said, on a large scale, yeah, overall, I'm happy. I'm healthy. Like you said, I have a dog. I've got family. I've got friends. I've got a career that I like. It's sunny all the fucking time. Um, Yeah, generally pretty happy. So Love that. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, I am lucky in that later in my life I've found like a number of things that like inspire me as like a human being like just inspire me to be alive right like whether it's art whether it's music whether it's like people's kindness and stuff like I've developed into this wholly unrecognizable <laughs> empathetic human being which has made life a lot better and a lot simpler um Definitely. what inspires you Ooh. Um, I think art 
is like any kind of art is the most inspiring to me. I don't know. I don't really, I haven't really thought about that until you just asked. It's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> different. I don't know. It depends. I get inspired by all different kinds of things. Yeah. You think um, of any usually, one thing? You know, actually I would change from art more to nature, like things that occur naturally and that you notice, or maybe you don't notice all the time, but when you do notice it, it like gives you that feeling. Mm -hmm. Whenever I get that feeling, I suddenly feel like, Oh, I got to go see everything and I got to go do everything. And I got to, you know, like you start thinking about all the things that you want to do. And yeah, that's that's the best way I can. I had that experience on my cross country trip two years ago where I was seeing things that, you know, I'd never seen in my life before, like whether it was animals or places and beautiful, beautiful, beautiful nature. And it's like awe inspiring. It is an awe inspiring experience to see things that are breathtakingly beautiful. I think that also, oddly enough, factors into the afterlife question, right? Like the sheer improbable fact that you and I are having this conversation on a fucking Tuesday on an iPad in <laughs> two different states on planet Earth spinning around the sun. How the fuck else could this not be here for a reason, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, anywhere you look, like, uh, my favorite way to put it is how can, you know, the Earth be such that it is and the sun be such that it is that we're, you know, moving and gravity and the soil and the air and the water is all just so perfect that it can perfectly ripen a tomato. Yeah, like it's an accident. Sure. It's not accidental yeah. whatsoever. You know, uh-huh. there's it's 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 designed. I, I I agree, and that's what that that's what is cool to me about life. And that's I think like when you start recognizing the beauty that is in things like that, like the sheer improbability of just being born, right? Like millions of sperm to one that you are an actual living breathing human being it's inspiring it's crazy you got to take life with a grain of salt because that's like just the fact that you're alive and breathing is is a miracle yeah i think that's why i like taking care of all these plants that i'm surrounded literally surrounded <laughs> in the jungle with because i i could just stare at them like i i don't even have to turn my tv on i can literally just look around my apartment that has hundreds of plants and they're all so different. They're all so different. They all need different things. Like, it's just, it's mind blowing. I can nerd out on that. How do you feel about moving all of those plants in the next month or so? I'm worried that they're not going to fit, to yeah. be totally honest with you. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but I think I have a nice little patio area that I can just stack you know, stuff up. Yeah, we'll see. We'll mm. see. Fingers crossed. Nice. Um, what is the best pe- piece of advice someone has ever given you? Um, from my therapist in college, I was having issues. My parents were getting divorced and it was, it was sucked. And I was really struggling with how my parents were both treating me. Like I could not comprehend, like, how can my, whoever forget this or say this to me or, you know, whatever it is. And he goes, Aaron, parents are just people. Mm. I, what? And he goes, well, what's your dad's name? And I told him and he goes, well, just think of him as that. Think of him as Bob, you know, like it's not my dad went and did this. It's Bob. He's living his life. You know what I mean? Like adults have to make decisions for themselves regardless of how many kids they have. And that really helped me not only with just my family, but with people like people are people, Mm -hmm. you know, everyone's got their own it kind of put into perspective, like walk a mile in my shoes or, um, you know, uh, what is the other one? Walk a mile, like see things from their perspective. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah. What is, what is your best piece of advice for everyone listening to you on this podcast for the first time? This is called wrong advice. Like I don't have good advice. It's a pun. (laughs) It is a pun. You should know that by now. What advice would I give to people? Who are hearing you for the first time on this podcast. I don't know. I would say be kind. That's my best advice. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Be a nice person. 
try at least. And if you're like me and you're like trying to be the best version of yourself and you scream motherfucker at people when you're driving your car because you have terrible road rage, just let it go. Just let it go. <laughs> yeah, no, I do that all the time too, but I still, <laughs> after that, try to like let somebody in my lane or, you know, do something. <laughs> I, I, I was having a conversation with my mom today while I was driving and... I started screaming at this person. She was like, John, what are you so mad about? I was like, this fucking idiot, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I'm literally in a rush for what? Like I'm rushing back to get to my apartment for what? There's no rush. There's no time constraint. There's nothing. There's no clock. There's nothing, right? Like time is an illusion. We, we made it up. So like, why am I worried about some guy who cut me off or some person who did something stupid? It's like a something I'm really working on and I'm going to work on it by selling my car. <laughs> yeah, no, that's maddening. It doesn't matter. It, like, and the thing is, it doesn't matter how good of a driver you are or how bad of a driver somebody else is. Everybody thinks that everybody else is a bad driver. Like the worst driver in the world does not realize that they're the problem. They, oh, totally. they, but they will drive around and be like this person. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> everybody does that everybody totally um my last question is give uh the listeners a recommendation for something that you've recently consumed uh it could be a book a podcast a movie a tv show just something that you've recently consumed that you really enjoyed and you want everyone to take a look at give me uh something that you've recently watched or read or you know anything that you think people should watch or see or watch listen or hear could be anything like my recommendation is inventing Anna, which you told me to watch. Um, it was really liked it that much. You'd recommend it. Yeah. So I think Julia Garner, I believe that's her name was so fucking good in what she portrayed as this lunatic oh, oh, human oh. being. And I don't think the show was all that great. Like it, it got in the weeds a lot with the reporter and all this dumb shit that didn't really factor into the story. Yeah. I didn't really like it. But she was so good. And I think I'm biased because she I, she's on Ozark and I fucking love Ozark. So I think I may have been biased, but she was just so great in that role. Like I think everyone should watch it because she was just incredibly talented in playing this psychopath. <laughs> yeah, um, I definitely liked that one. I'm glad you liked it too. I think if I were picking mine, I recently started watching movies, which I never ever watch movies. So I've just been randomly picking and I think the reason I don't watch movies is because I'm never really impressed with them. I'm not <laughs> like, oh my gosh, that was such a good movie. And I hate when movies make me cry. So that's like 50% of them. <laughs> but I watched this movie the other day and I, it took me like half of the movie to realize that this was like an eight-year-old Christian Bale. Um, but it's called Empire of the Sun. And I actually really like that. Like I'm still thinking about that movie. So mm -hmm. kind cool. of a random old ass movie but i really liked it nice so put it on the favorite. list uh will it um first of all thank you so much for coming on the podcast today obviously you know how much i care about you and i love you as a human being and i'm so glad that we're friends and Aww. i'm so appreciative that you took this hour with me today to come on the wrong advice podcast and gave such overwhelmingly light and positive things to say and yeah, I'm just incredibly <laughs> grateful that you gave me your time and was my 75th guest on, or 75th episode of the Wrong Advice Podcast. Thank you so much. Well, my dear, it was honestly my pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Bye. <laughs>